everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, and I hope you are too. Everything's going good here in Sofa Land, and I hope the Sofa Squad is doing good. Anyways, today we are going to be talking about an older case. This one has been solved, but it's kind of resurrected, and I watched this episode. Uh, it, it just struck my interest, and so I kind of went down a little rabbit hole, and I want to share that information with you. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so today we are going to be discussing the case of Kenneth Osborne, who is the perpetrator, uh, and the victim is Casey Crowder. Now, where I came about this was in the Netflix series, True Crimes Confessions, Season 2, Episode 1, and the name of it is Gaslight, if y'all want to look it up. So, this is recent, it just came out, and so I watched this, and this is kind of about, this, this show kind of focuses on confessions, and, and so I'll give them that. So, what happened with this is, I, I was sitting here watching this, and I was like, what? Huh? I have so many questions in addition to what they were showing me. And so I did a little research and found out that this show, this, this case had already been featured on a show called See No Evil. And it was featured in 2017, I believe. It was season number three, episode number 10, and it was called Breakdown at Daylight. Now, for that one, I did find it on YouTube and paid $2 to watch it. Within five minutes, I found it for free, but that's okay. I got to see it. So, I watched that episode and I was like, wait, st st time out, stop, fluff the sofa, something, Please hold, clutch my pearls, all that stuff. I was like, there are two totally different stories being presented. And so I started kind of researching a little bit, and I still have some unanswered questions. Uh, but I just wanted to come in here and kind of, you know, there's a few directions I want to go with this. One thing that I think it brings up the topic of is the interest of, in this day and age, how we consume uh, these cases like this. And so one, you know, narrative can t make you think this and another narrative can make you think this. And it's very interesting to me how those pictures are painted. What is my opinion of this? When I watched the confessions tape on, on Netflix, I was like, oh my God, this guy is completely innocent. I cannot believe this. How is he, how did this even hold up in court? Yada, yada, yada. And so then when I watched See No Evil, I was like, eh, yeah, so he's probably guilty. But, you know, there's definitely reasonable doubt. And there's also some unanswered questions about other possible suspects. Uh, so, you know, do I think he's guilty or not? I, the evidence that I've seen, I'm like, I mean, I don't know if I could convict him, you know, a, a, if I was in the court or whatever. That being said, we're just going to kind of review each thing. And we're going to also start with See No Evil, since that one came out first, and then round our way out to the most recent one. Before we also go into it, I also want to say, you know, what, regardless of if this gentleman is guilty or not, I do not agree with the tactics that were used in getting his confession, and we'll go over those, because this is my thing with that. When rules are bent and broken and all this kind of stuff, you know, if he's guilty, he's going to get to walk out of jail eventually because his case was overturned, and I'll get into that in a minute. And he took a lesser sentence. I mean, he's still in there for a hot minute, uh, but he's not in there for life anymore. And so I'm like, okay, if he is guilty of this crime, he's, you know, because of breaking the rules and how they interrogated him and stuff, he gets to walk out for free. Also, if he's not guilty of this crime, well, then for sure, uh, you know, it's a travesty that he's even in there for one more day. And number two, it's even worse the tactics that they used to get this confession out of him. So, you know, and I always revert back to the staircase because I'm just like, okay, and again, don't even ask me at this point if he's guilty or not. You know, I just, I, I just scratch my head over that one. But regardless, because of false evidence, things like that, breaking the rules. If he is guilty, you know, Mr. Peterson's living, you know, not too far away from me, uh, a free man, you know, so if he's not guilty, then, you know, kudos to you, but you still, you know, didn't go about it the right way. So that's why I just really believe that 
you know, following the law and how you do these confessions and things of that nature is the best way in everyone's interest because the truth will rise. And innocent people don't need to be in jail and guilty people do need to be. So with that being said, I'm going to put my little soap box over here and now let's officially begin. Okay, so we're gonna start with See No Evil, Breakdown at Daylight, season three, number 10. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a little bit and just talk about the victim because at the end of the day, you know, it's easy to get caught up in who's guilty, this person and that person, but at the end of the day, a 17-year-old girl lost her life and her family is, you know, broken over this. Uh, her mother will never get this out of her mind. It's, it's a travesty. So, now this happened in 2006. Pardon me. Uh, and the victim's name was Casey Crowder. Uh, she was the first child. Her parents said she was a tomboy. She was very self-confident. She loved to play baseball. She was close to her mother. You know, she, pardon, she was getting ready to be a senior. And so she just really had a lot ahead of her. To me, she sounded like one of those kids, young adults, whatever you want to call her, uh, that just kind of knew what they wanted and were going after it type situation. Uh, and when all this went down, there's some things that came up to where some people might say, well, why didn't the, they go pick her up or this? And I, I mean, I knew girls like this. I knew guys like this, but her personality reminds me of a very good friend that I had. And this was the type young lady that she just, she had it. Don't, don't worry. I got it. I got it. I've got this. And you just didn't really worry about certain things that you might. And that's basically how they described Casey Crowder here. And, you know, I just think it's unfortunate that whatever took place with her, whoever she came into contact, you know, exploited this part of her. And unfortunately she's not here anymore. So, you know, my heart goes out to the mother. It was very hard watching the mother's, uh, test, not testimony, but you know, her talking and the case because your heart just goes out. I mean, it's hard horrible to lose a child and especially under these circumstances. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and start getting into some of the case details. August 27, 2006, Casey goes missing. And I'm just going to quickly go over, you know, some key points here about this. So the mother got up at 5.30 a.m. in the morning to start getting ready. She had a super busy day that day with lots of running around, dinner, church, all this type of stuff. Uh, she got a call from Casey saying that she ran out of gas and she was on the side of the road. And she told her mom that she was going to, the night before, she had told her mother that she was spending the night with her girlfriends and whatnot. And the mother was actually kind of like, okay, good, you know, you're spending all your time with your boyfriend, you're young, you need to hang out with the girls, that type thing. So, but Casey had actually gone to her boyfriend's house. Her calling her mother, because of where the town was that the boyfriend lived, she essentially had to admit that she had gone to her boyfriend's house. Her mother was like, do you want to come get you? I'll come right now. She's like, no, absolutely not. I've got this. You know, there's a hospital really close I can walk to. There's a gas station. You know, I've got this. And, and like I said, she was just that type of person that her mother believed her. She was like, that's how Casey is. You know, this is a, a, a person that she said she had it. Okay, I trust you. So the mother got to the church at nine and she called Casey, uh, left a message, didn't get her. She still really wasn't that concerned about it at that point because, again, you know, this is a 17-year-old. I mean, when I was 17, I was running all around. So she had a busy day, so it was what it was. Around noon, she tried getting a hold of her again, and that's when this started being like, what's going on? So essentially, by midnight that night, she still had not heard from Casey. So when her husband got in, I guess he had two jobs or he worked two double shifts that day, something like that. So when he got back in around that time, she was, like, falling apart. She's like, oh, my God. So they hopped in the car and they drive to where, you know, Casey had kind of said she broke down, which is like a little bit of a, you know, it was a hot minute away. And uh, they find her car right where it was, where it had run out of gas. And so then, I mean, obviously they're like, this is something that's not right. They call the police, the cops come, they do a search party the next day. And uh, agents begin basically canvassing all the businesses around there for security cam footage. Eventually they find that a, a Sonic burger has CCTV and it's only like 400 yards from where the car broke down. And so that cam shows part of the, the road. And that the videotape from that, they would lead them to the suspects. And I'm gonna talk about all the suspects and whatnot in just a minute. Uh, but that camera would lead them to the suspects and that footage, along with some footage from another place, is kind of what ultimately led them to Kenneth Osborne. Uh, but, but we'll get into that momentarily. So after about a week that she was missing, her decomposing body was found. It had a zip tie around the neck. Um, 
Okay, now let's talk about some of the suspects. And a lot of time in these TV shows and whatnot, or these movies, whatever, you know, <clears throat> they'll go down a, su a, a path of the suspect to either throw you off, or maybe it happened, but they don't give too much attention to it, or whatever. So the suspects I'm about to talk about, when I was watching this, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, what? You know, I have, so, and still do, have so many questions about this, because something just doesn't add up to me. And this is one of those things where if somebody out there watching this is local to this that happened and knows anything about this, you know, drop it like it's hot in the comments, y'all. So the first suspects they came across were her boyfriend. Obviously, that's the first person to go to. That's who's, how she came from, the whole nine yards. Her boyfriend's name was Adam. He said, they say that they visit him, uh, and he says they went to a party the night before. They came back to his house. They smoked some weed. They fooled around. They went to sleep. So, you know, he's, this is not something you want to tell, the, especially the parents of your girlfriend who are very church-going and whatnot. And he says that she left around five-ish, which kind of adds up. Uh, right before she left, his co-worker and a friend stopped by to see if he wanted to go fishing. And initially, he said no. Now, the, those names are Jay and Jimmy, and they'll play kind of a very interesting role. So they bring, you know, they go in, they bring them for question. They both said that they saw her car abandoned, um, and then he said he went back to Adams to tell him about the car. It, they saw the car abandoned. They went to a gas station. They they see if she's there. She's not. They go back to the car, and then they go back to Adams to say, "Hey, you know, Casey's car is abandoned on the side of the road." And Adam tried calling her several times, but it went to voicemail. And so then those three spent the rest of the day fishing. Now, let's pause here for a second. So another aspect that took place is apparently when she broke down, she tried contacting, I think it was Jimmy, like four times, and he never answered or something like that. So, because my first question is, why didn't you just call your boyfriend? You know, or why didn't you... I mean, obviously she was probably far enough away from the house that it was difficult to walk. But I this, this part doesn't make sense to me because I'm just like, why didn't you call your boyfriend, number one? And why does it say that it, why, maybe he didn't have a phone? Because the fact that his friends Jimmy and Jay said we had to go back to tell him that her cars broke down. I'm just like, okay, so maybe he didn't have a phone and that's why she was calling Jimmy. But then if she called him four times, why didn't he answer? There's There's things about this aspect that throw me off. So... Uh, and then at the end of that, I'm like, and so y'all just spent the rest of the day fishing? I mean, that part doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah, because I'm sitting here thinking, okay, if I drove by and saw Matt's car on the side of the road, obviously it's different. I would try calling, whatever. And if I couldn't get him, I might be like, well, maybe he, you know, maybe he's up at the gas, the next, whatever the thing up at the road is, you know. But I want to be comfortable just going and fishing the rest of the day. So I feel like there's chunks of story missing from this trio. Because they're obviously suspects, but they were, you know, somehow cleared or whatever. And so, you know, it just comes down to it. It doesn't paint any of them in a good picture, especially the boyfriend. Because I'm just like, you know, was it a boyfriend or a hookup? I mean... You know, I don't know, and I haven't been able to get these answers yet. So, again, if there's anybody watching that, you know, has some info on that, feel free to drop it like it's hot down there because I find that very interesting. Let's go, uh, let's continue on and let's look at the evidence of Kenneth Osborne. So, when they're looking at all of this video evidence, you know, on the, the closed caption TV, the surveillance videos, um, it's, and I'm going to name some times out here and whatnot. So on the Sonic video, at 6.42 a.m., they see his truck drive by. At 6.45, they see the same truck going back the other way. Uh, so this truck went in the direction that Casey went, and then three minutes later, seen going back the other way. So eventually, they go to a family dollar, and they get more footage. And at 6.46 a.m., they see his truck again on there. Now, this family dollar is basically... Uh, it's in a different part of town, so but not too far away, but you know, it's a direction. We'll get to that. So they deduct that the driver was headed out of town at 642, made a U-turn, heads back through town, past the family dollar, and makes a right onto Route 165, which is in the direction to the woods where Casey was found. It basically, uh, if you go into this a little further, the, there's no connecting roads that would take him other ways. It's almost like that's the only place he could have been going when he went this way. 
is that? Now, at this point, they don't know that's him. They're trying to find the truck. They set a roadblock up. Uh, he comes through that roadblock with his daughter, uh, and he actually has two children in there. And they're basically like, they question him, and they're like, you know, do you come this way? I mean, they know it's the guy they're looking for, and they're like, could you come and talk to the cops? And he's like, absolutely, comes the next day. He says the reason he goes this way is he drops his daughter off at work, and which, you know, is totally true. So when he comes in, the agents, number one, they notice scratches on his arms, and he says it was a dog. And they basically deduct that he would have driven right past Casey's uh, car. Please hold. One more. I'm talking so much. He doesn't mention turning back around or anything. So when confronted about this, he's like, oh, well, you know what? I ran out of cigarettes, and so I went back to get some at the store that I was at or whatever. Basically, this is what he said. Basically, he says he went, dropped his daughter off, did a U-turn, then realized he forgot smokes, so he turns around again, but the video evidence doesn't support that. So the video evidence does not support that testimony, and so there's that. So, I mean, there's a little bit like, okay, well, why, are you, why is this not adding up? Then they obtain his cell phone records. And his, and now, and y'all, before we even get into this, we already know, especially if you watch Serial Season 1, about pinging and stuff like that. So, I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to tell what they claim is the evidence, and I'll give my little opinion on that when I'm done. So, but we're going into that with as a grain of salt. So, they get his phone records. They say that his phone pinged at 7 a.m. at a tower near where her car was found. At 7.13, his phone pinged near where her body was found. There was no ping near his house. He stated that he went home after he got those cigarettes. Here's the thing. The only part of that that I'm like, mm, okay, is the fact that his phone did not ping near his home. Because we know, and again, I don't, I, I'm not, you know, I don't have everything laid out here to be like, and here's the exact map and the mileage and this and that and da-da-da, you know. But these aren't huge distances we're talking about. So for me, I'm just like, okay, and again, we know how pinging is. The only thing that I feel like this tells me, I mean, of course it's interesting that it's like, okay, so you're pinging near her car and you're pinging near her body, you know, but I'm like, that could be here nor there. The fact that it didn't ping near his home, which is in the opposite direction away from this, where you would expect no confusion. You know what I mean? It's like, it's either going to ping here, or, you know, here's these two pings, but there's no ping way over here, which is where it should be pinging. So, you know what I'm saying? So this tells me he was somewhere over here, but he wasn't over here, and he's saying he was over there. And, uh, and again, the video evidence doesn't, pr it doesn't prove that. They, they would know if he went back that way. All of that evidence was not enough to prove that he killed her, obviously. You know, the town starts talking, you know, rumors go, whatever. A, a co-worker of his, Kenny's daughter came forward, and basically she was like, um, you know what, I pass him every morning on the way to work. We always wave at each other. And she's like, I passed him this morning, and I waved, but he didn't acknowledge me. And there was someone slumped over in his passenger seat that morning. And she's like, at first I thought it was uh, his daughter, which was her co-worker. And, uh, but she's like, when I got to work, she was already there. So she was like, you know, I mean, there was a girl slumped over in his thing. Uh, now, also... There is some confusion, and, and I believe we'll get into this more on the next, on the Confessions tape one, about the person claiming that the the, the figure had black hair. And uh, so it's like, well, this girl had, the victim had blonde hair. So there's a little bit of a, okay. But they use this eyewitness testimony to arrest him. And uh, they interrogate him for hours. He confesses. He says he put the zip tie around her neck to control her. I was taken to the woods. Uh, he, you know, it was an accident to kill her. She panicked, and he started freaking out. And you know, essentially, and again, remember, we're just kind of going through the lens right now of the previous one, see no evil. Uh, and so that's essentially what they wrap up here. And you know, so. Yay, the criminal's caught and all this. They don't go into the confession like we see on the next one. So, as you can see, watching this one, I'm like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> You're done. Guilty. You know, I'm like, there's enough things here, but also enough questions. So, this is where I'm like, mm, I definitely have reasonable doubt, but it doesn't look good either. So, you know, my questions are 
the boyfriend and his friends. You know, what's up with that? You know, at the end of the day, is it just a crappy boyfriend? Uh, next question is DNA. Hello, you're accusing him of having all these scars. Why hasn't DNA been tested in this case? I have not found anything so far. I could be wrong. I, this isn't an end-all, be-all documentary on this. Um, so do with that what you will. It leaves questions. And, you know, what did this girl see in his car? There's that. Let's move on to the next one and talk about very briefly like that one because it completely focuses, in my opinion, on the confession aspect. Okay, so now remember, this is the second season of the confession. Essentially, what they're showing here is a lot of cops threatening him. Uh, and let's just really focus on, you know, the, the aspect of what they show with the confession. Yeah, the cops threaten him. They take him to the sheriff's garage to film the confession. Now, they say that basically they're like, like you know, oh, well, with the media and it's better to do this. And I'm just like, eh, yeah. Now, remember, before this, he had completely cooperated. He was like, take my DNA. It'll prove that the shoe wasn't in there. Take my DNA. Pull the polygraph out. Like, let's let's go. You know, so that always, to me, says something. You know, if someone's that, you know, like, come on, let's do it. You know, either they're just really brave. And, I mean, I'm not trying to say people don't do that and they totally have killed a person. And they're like, well, I'm just going to ride this up to the very end. Call their bluff. Uh, but, you know, it's it's interesting that he very much is just like, no, it'll prove that. You know, because even he's saying, you know, okay, you'll find my, you'll, you're going to see my DNA's not under her fingernails and this, that, and the other. So, you know... And again, that's one of the mysteries of this case for me, and I might do an update to it. Uh, so, anyways, let's continue. But he's very cooperative. The fact that they took him to the garage, I'm just like, oh, absolutely not. First of all, can you imagine if that was you? Like, that's going to make you think, they're going to kill me. I mean, that's what I would be thinking. Like, this is, what's what are we doing? Why am I in the sheriff's garage, the sheriff-elect? Why am I in his garage? You know, so that part was absolutely no. You know, you see on video, he's wanting to, he's asking for a lawyer. And that's, well, we'll get into that. They make up fake evidence to show that he was there. So if you watch this, remember they show him a picture with a truck that looks like his. And they're saying like, we got these from our good boys in Nisha. You know, and they're showing him. And okay, if he's not guilty... And they're showing him a picture of his truck on video near the crime scene. I mean, wouldn't you be like, okay, did I, like, did I, did I have an episode and do some not so savory things while having that episode? Uh, this, though, I mean, they admit that they made that up. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> because here's my thing, and I already said it again. The fact that you're making up evidence now, I, we can't believe anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you question everything that they're 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 doing. Because if you're gonna lie about that, well, then you know, okay, is there planted DNA? Is there planted this? Is there is there, you know the whole nine yards? Now in this one, they have a woman named Nancy Dunn testifying that she saw Kenny going out to the river. And that she saw a black hair girl slashed over in the seat. I don't know if this is another, a separate witness in addition to the co-worker or whatever. But, you know, and she was like, I felt bad testifying about what I saw. But my whole thing is like, I mean, why? Why? I mean, this she's testifying that she saw somebody totally different. You know, his daughter has darker hair. The victim has blonde hair. So that part, I'm just like, mm. you know, eyewitness testimony can be very tricky, especially when it's, you know, done, you know, years later. They get this confession out of him. And watching them do the confession and knowing the context of what's going on, it seems very phony. It seems very leading him in, you know, now what did you say and why are you saying this to us? And things of this nature. So, you know, I'm just like, really? And again, watching this episode, you're cut, you're left with like, this is, I mean, this is, you know, absolutely not right. So, you know, he goes to trial. He is found guilty after like three hours of deliberations. And then, it, so it's a death penalty trial. 11 to 1 for the death penalty. So... He gets life in prison. And now, here's my thing with the death penalty, and we've talked about this on the channel some. This is why, with the death penalty, I'm just like, you have to really know that the person's guilty. Because this, what I've seen, you know, and again, the jurors, I'm guessing and hoping they see way more evidence than we're being shown and what we can see on TV and whatnot. Um, but... I mean, I wouldn't be able to vote for the death penalty at all. There's definitely reasonable doubt. I don't think I could convict him of guilt, you know, knowing that there's all these unanswered questions based on what I've seen. So, 
let's continue on with the, you know, the the ending or whatever. Um, so he gets life in prison. Uh, June twenty fifth, two thousand nine, his conviction was overturned. Now, so he was sentenced in two thousand eight. So like a year later, it gets overturned, and uh, because the investigators continued questioning him after he asked for an attorney. So, big no-no. I mean, they messed up on many levels. And so, and this is where I'm like, okay, well, if he was guilty, I mean, y'all didn't follow the rules, and this is what happens. So, he got a new trial, and on June 14th, 2014, he pled guilty to kidnapping and second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to a total of 40 years. It was like 30 years for the murder, 10 years for the kidnapping, and he has to serve, you know, not consecutive, uh, not concurrent, uh, consecutive or whatever. So, 40 years. Now, he is claiming in this, like, towards the end of the show, he's basically saying that his lawyer told him it was only going to be, like, seven years and this, that, and the other. So, I went and found his appeal document, or whatever you want to call it. Because he then, so he gets 40 years, so he had a life sentence. Then he gets 40 years. And he's like, well, no, it's, you know, this. So, he appeals that. You know, he looks for post-conviction relief for that. And this is essentially what the their ruling said. So, they didn't give it to him, you know, spoiler alert. It didn't work. But this is why they said that. Uh, He's basically saying that his counsel didn't tell him this and this and the other. And so I'm just going to read this very quickly for you. In its order denying Osborne's Rule 37 petition, the circuit court stated that it had reviewed the guilty plea hearing transcript along with Osborne's plea statement and sentencing recommendation. At the guilty plea hearing, Osborne was advised by the court that he was pleading guilty to kidnapping and second-degree murder in exchange for an aggregate aggregate sentence of 40 years imprisonment. Osborne said that he understood the plea and that the total maximum statutory penalty for these crimes was life imprisonment. He testified that he further understood the rights he was giving up by pleading guilty. He stated that he had seen, signed, and understood his plea statement that confirmed the state's sentencing recommendation of 40 years imprisonment. Osborne testified that he reviewed the plea statement with his attorney. He confirmed there were no forces, threats, or promises used to get him to enter his guilty plea. When asked what his plea was, Osborne stated that he was pleading guilty to it. So that continues to go on further, but I thought that was the most imperative part, and I'm not going to bore y'all with, you know, legal mumbo-jumbo or whatever. Um, But it just goes on to basically be like, you totally knew what you were signing up for. Now, in court, it can be very intimidating. It's a totally different feeling. And so, you know, part of it's like, well, that's your time to jump up and scream, I didn't do this. You know, his life is on the line. And so I have no doubt that he could have, you know, and a lot of times these attorneys are like, look, just sign, you know, I get that. But usually in the courtroom, there is this level of you're doing this, you understand this, yes or no. So if he felt kind of pushed through that process, I mean, and unfortunately, it is what it is at this point. So, you know, I don't know if he would be able to get relief from that. The fact that he got a life sentence converted down to 40 years is like, wow, if he's guilty. You know, again, this brings up the whole argument. And I'm curious to see what y'all say. For those who have seen it, uh, you know, I'm very curious. Both Like, watch both episodes. See what you think and come back to the comments and let me know. Because, again, watching both of them, I'm in the middle. I'm like, I'm not really convinced either way. You know, if... If, if I'm going to say he's guilty, well, I have reasonable doubt about that. And if I'm going to say he's innocent, I have questions about that, too. You know, why would you lie about, you know, where your car was going? Why is your phone not pinging at home? You know, why, basically, why are you lying about all this stuff type situation? Now, another thing that I have completely forgotten to bring up, and so, of course, it's going to be here at the end. Um, and let me see if I can find it real quick. Some of the courtroom testimony, and again, this is like a more witness testimony a grain of salt type situation, but someone, uh, it was testimony of Connie Sparks. Uh, she testified that in the early eighties, basically, uh, she knew him through hook or crook, you know, like her sister's boyfriend or something like that. And, um, I don't want to go into the whole thing because this is a long video, but she knew him. And so he basically was like, Hey, come help me find my car. She got in the car with him. They went to look for it. When they got there, there was no car. And he basically tried to sexually assault her and she got away. She ran home. And so again, you know, without a hundred percent of the context of who this human being is testifying, we don't know, you know, if this is true or not, but it was testimony brought up. And so there's that of, okay, well, this is true. And he's tried to do this before. 
you see where I'm going with this, but a lot of this is just not enough for me. I need proof. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need some DNA. I need some fingerprints. I need to know that girl was in that car. And so convicting someone on a, in my opinion, a completely coerced confession, uh, because again, even if he was telling the truth, the surrounding aspects of how they got to that are coerced and therefore it's unbelievable especially because they made evidence up you know and that's where I'm just like just go by the book I get that it's frustrating I get you 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 hone in on these people and they think that they did it and they're like no you know all this stuff adds up we've got to do whatever we do but then at the end of the day the truth number prevails and God forbid that there's a killer walking around that town that got away with taking this beautiful young girl's life so anyways this has turned into a long video uh, I hope you enjoyed it if you're still stuck sitting here with me stuck with me um again totally interested to hear what y'all have to say so just drop it like it's hot down there uh, i really appreciate it i hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we shall talk to you soon bye silver squad